just uh, summarize very quickly the uh, current, the new report that was um, summarized for the General Assembly this morning. Uh, the new report is really, uh, of course, following the mandate and expressed in a certain way from a certain angle of my own analysis. And what I usually do is to start off recognizing some constructive developments and then I go into the challenges. And the way that the challenges have been addressed in the current report uh, is or are to uh, look at rights from the angle of various freedoms. So freedom from want, freedom from fear, freedom from discrimination, freedom from persecution, and freedom from exploitation. And at the end of the report, there is a set of recommendations to DPR Korea as well as to the international community. Having said that, what is evident from the current situation as projected by this report is that, first of all, uh, I have always uh, put great emphasis on the importance of there being parties to human rights treaties, and they are parties to four human rights treaties. And this past year, under the Convention on the Rights of the Child, the DPRK went before the Child Rights Committee, had a dialogue, and the key recommendations from the Child Rights Committee, which we can bear in mind for this year and for the future, including the need to improve protection for children in difficulties, children in institutions, street children, and the like. Secondly, um, I would just note that um, after I wrote this report, um, I became aware of a very recent amendment of the national constitution of the DPR career. And the recent amendment over the past year, which I noted before the assembly this morning, is that they have now included verbally human rights into the constitution. And they pretty well erase references to communism, Leninism, Marxism, and so on, while integrating into the constitution their own brand of socialism based upon what we call juche, which is self-reliance, which is really um, entrenchment of the dynastic top-down uh, power base. And importantly, with the amendment, the military first policy, which is now entrenched. Having said that, of course, I welcome the fact that human rights are reflected. And yet, by the fact of juxtaposition with military first policy, uh, somehow we can feel that um, the uh, uh, referral or reference to human rights is somewhat undermined. And my own thesis, which was projected to the assembly this morning, was and is to advocate a people first policy rather than the military first policy, precisely because military first policy has uh, led to various consequences, nuclearization, militarization, distortion of budgets and so on, to the detriment of people in the country as well as uh, to the international community in terms of the international accountability that has arisen on the nuclearization process. With regard to freedom from want, which is the first element of the analysis, um, there is critical food shortage even though the weather, the harvest has been better over the past two years. The World Food Program is now able to cover as aid to the needy about 1.4 million people only out of over 6 million targeted coverage. And that's because the World Food Program is not able to get sufficient funding to cover the 6, plus, 6 point million plus uh, target and is only able to cover 1.4 at this point in time. So food aid is important. It should be supported, bearing in mind that food aid also depends upon monitoring to ensure accountability. No access, no food provision. That's the usual UN principle. And um, currently, World Food Program access has declined from uh, over 100 counties being covered last year or earlier this year to some 60 counties being covered now. So there's decline of food access at this point in time, as well as geographic coverage. Uh, while I am in favor of sustained food aid, I would also bear in mind that food aid alone is never adequate. It has to be coupled with food security. So this morning in the GA, a lot was said about food security, particularly in terms of agricultural, sustainable development, with people's participation in benefit sharing. And currently, the authorities have ordered people to go out in this so-called 
day battle or campaign to produce food without the incentives for real enjoyment of uh, food benefits. So there's a limit to how much you can order p people to produce and it won't be very successful for obvious reasons because a lot of people won't be benefiting directly under this while they're being ordered to produce food under the 150-day program. So food security depends much more upon people's participation in food generation, conservation and benefit sharing and enjoyment, which are not being responded to adequately by the authorities. Likewise, we should bear in mind that the country is not poor. Uh, their volume of export and trade last year was several billion. And where does the money go? The country is not poor, and yet the money is not spent on the people. So that is why I advocate not a military first policy, but a people first policy. Because people should be entitled to a fair share of the budget and the benefits from trade in terms of access to sustainable development. Secondly, the question of freedom from fear. Well, regrettably, people are not freed or free from fear because we're dealing with a non-democratic system. And so you have all the transgressions, which are listed not just in my report, but many other reports, etc. Uh, persecution, clampdown, collective punishment, uh, torture, um, arbitrary executions, public executions, etc. Uh, despite various formal guarantees in the Constitution and the criminal law. I've also noted that uh, from the angle of um, freedom from fear, because people are not freed from fear, one concern also is that the administration, the administrative authorities like local committees and so on, have a lot of administri administrative power through their discretion to punish people like dismissal, fines and re-education without due process of law. So I have highlighted this in the sense that we have a sort of extrajudicial mechanism, so to speak, in terms of admin uh, discretion, which has negative impact on people. Uh, and also, we should bear in mind that freedom from fear is affected by the fact that the country, the authorities, have been involved through the years in abductions. Japanese cases not resolved yet, as well as many other countries affected. And in this report, in the GA, I've also raised the consequences of the Korean War of the early 1950s in terms of the need to address family reunion more concretely as well as missing persons and prisoners of war. Thirdly, freedom from discrimination, question mark. Well, the elite do well, but the non-elite don't do so well. And um, I've been very concerned that women have been extremely affected. During the last year, I was informed that women traders uh, who were wearing trousers were being forced to change into skirts and they were not allowed to use bicycles. And these, these are just little examples of how traders, women particularly, were being impeded from being involved in economic activities. And over the past three years, after experimenting a little bit with market freedom, markets are being closed. Women under a certain age group are not allowed to be traders, and uh, there's been a clampdown on markets generally, as well as small plot gardening, together with uh, very um, idiosyncratic examples such as the skirt situation, the trouser situation, and the bicycle situation that I've just noted. And there have been clashes between women traders and the authorities, incredibly, I mean, in terms of demonstrations. Um, so I advocate very strongly, together with respect for women's involvement in uh, enterprises, the need to respect people's right to be involved in economic activities, especially if the state is not able or willing to satisfy their needs. So the state's trying to make people dependent upon the ration system, which doesn't function. And we must respect people's right to be involved in economic choices for their survival. The fourth element is freedom from persecution. And of course, sadly, people are not free from persecution because if you fall foul of the regime, there's collective punishment. And we've had a flow of people into neighboring countries for a long time, at times because of persecution, at times because of food-related deprivations. And sadly, over the past year, I've had many reports of people being punished, been, been punished more for trying to leave. And also collective punishments meted out to families of those who've left 
clandestinely. So this, these uh, uh, conditions in terms of outflow as well as influx into other countries have been, has been much more stringent over the past year. And I can give you as an illustration this. Two or three weeks ago I was in Mongolia where there's usually an influx of DPRK nationals over the past few years. Usually about at least 150. Last year was nearly 200. This year, currently in the second half, there is no influx. Not a single one able to enter Mongolia, even though Mongolia is open to uh, providing safe haven. The 30 to 35 that arrived in the first half of the year have all left for the U US and Republic of Korea. And currently there's no influx as of three weeks ago because of the stringent conditions en route, particularly in the country of origin. And I advocate very strongly the position that however or whatever classification we confer on these people, whether we see them as refugees or not, the policy of all countries should be humane approach, no pushback to dangers, and respect for their basic rights, whatever these people are. And also, to be fair, to help transit countries provide humanitarian shelter along the way. Finally, on the question of freedom from exploitation, question mark, of course there is ex extremely systemic exploitation by the very fact that the country is not poor, it has more mineral resources than the neighboring country next door that bears half the same name at this moment. Uh, and yet, the resources are not being used equitably for people's development. And it is incumbent upon the international community to influence constructively the authorities to use the resources they have equitably for people's development, which has not taken place adequately. In that perspective, I round off my report by advocating various recommendations, short-term and long-term. I would say they're pretty doable recommendations. And this morning I said to the DPRK that actually it would be good political capital for DPRK to follow the recommendations. Not difficult, and it's good capital as well as to be respectful of human rights. For example, number one, I advocate humanitarian aid unconditionally on the basis of monitoring to ensure that food gets to the people. But not just that, it should also be coupled with food security and coupled with respect for people's right to be involved in economic activities and choices, especially women now, as opposed to the clampdown which impedes people from generating the wherewithal to exist. And there's a lot of malnutrition still, as well as hunger. I estimate at least a third of the population are in the hunger situation out of the projected 24 million. Secondly, they should stop public executions. Thirdly, they should stop punishing people for leaving and if they're sent back. Fourthly, they should um, resolve the abductions issue satisfactorily, expeditiously, as well as to address the consequences of the Korean War, particularly family reunions some of which we've seen over the past two months, 200-odd that have met in Mount Kumgang area between the two countries, South and DPRK, for example. And then to engage with this mandate and others. And to date, of course, they've not engaged in terms of enabling me to access the country. And the whole uh, perspective should be also open to longer-term strategies, such as to uh, implement a people-first policy rather than military-first policy, more longer-term food security, uh, to address the root causes of displacement, as well as to encourage them to engage with the UN system, together uh, with this new system that uh, is being implemented uh, called the Universal Period Review. They, DPRK, will go before this UPR in December, and uh, I'm happy to uh, elaborate on this in a moment if you wish. But in any case, what I do invite is that uh, they engage well with the UPR, and that uh, the um, process at the Human Rights Council should bear in mind this non-cooperation with this mandate as an indicator of how they perform. And finally, the rep uh, report uh, from me uh, has recommendations targeted to the international community, including inviting the UN to take a more comprehensive approach. I think that um, at the moment we're able to deal with this issue at the Human Rights Council and GA level. I think it's high time that the total UN system should look at this, including the Security Council. And having said that, UN presences in DPRK at this point in time are important, 
UNICEF's there, and I welcome that, bearing in mind that I would like to have more access. And bearing in mind also that um, in terms of uh, the future, it is important to encourage DPRK to be more accountable and to be more responsive to human rights as a whole, bearing in mind the very vulnerable groups such as women, children, the elderly, the food deprived, etc., who are covered by my report and to whom I have direct access because I go and interview them in these various other countries, though I have no direct access to DPRK.